Yeah, I'm, I'm Kent Moffitt. I'm the product manager for the Math Kernel Library and uh, Data Analytics Acceleration Library. And one of the main applications of those is in machine learning and AI, um, as well as more traditional HPC, particularly for the Math Kernel Library. Okay, okay. So this is a big, burgeoning growth area, I would guess, judging by what Intel's investing in, right, with new companies and such. So your office is to get the tools so that people can create deep learning using Intel hardware, is that the um, gist? Deep or? learning and more general <laughs> machine learning. Because ah. well, So deep learning is a particularly hot area um, mm -hmm. involving, you know, you train models you know, on a neural network kind of model, modeled after, you know, brain architecture. Yeah. Um, but there's also, you know, been decades of work in more, I guess you call it traditional machine learning or statistical machine learning techniques. Um, and what we see is that uh, people using a combination of these, so typically you don't use deep learning alone, use that with some of these statistical techniques. And in the libraries, what our goal is really to encapsulate performance so that you know, developers of frameworks or um, various kinds of machine learning software don't have to do all the threading and vectorization things themselves. They just make library calls, you know, we take care of that, we've all tuned that for our, you know, our, our, all our processor families, try to make that easier from a, uh, for people to get the performance they need for these, you know, very hungry compute applications. Okay. Okay. We were talking earlier, and you, you mentioned that there was, there's like a wide breadth of code that exists out there, but it wasn't necessarily tuned for IA architecture, right, or designed with performance in mind. Can you kind of describe the state of things? Yeah, that's true. So there's a, there's a variety really a huge variety of open source software out there in both the traditional machine learning and the deep learning space. Yeah. Um, and because it's so popular, um, more and more of these frameworks have sprung up. I think over the last year or two, there's, you know, there's many per month kind of thing, right? So um, some from big like uh, commercial entities, cloud service providers like Google and Amazon and people like this, others from in industry or uh, uh, academia, you know, so the CAFE framework out of Berkeley, things like that. So a wide variety of sources and variety of uh, sort of priorities they put on performance versus functionality for their frameworks. So some of these might not have been as well threaded or vectorized, for instance, or they optimized for a different compute architecture and, and didn't happen to do that for, for Intel architecture yet. Um, so there can be there's a whole range of things. And so part of what we're trying to do with the libraries in particular is make it easy for people to optimize those frameworks. And we're doing a lot of that work at Intel as well, um, and then providing that back to people to use. So, um, so a range of activities really to, to make that easier and make everything run faster, because basically machine learning code, you can use as much compute and as much efficiency as you can get, um, mm -hmm. particularly for like the, the training aspects of machine learning models. Those are the really compute intensive parts that you know, can, can theoretically run for days or, or longer, depending on the size of the task. Yeah. Now, I read that some of these algorithms might be 25 years old or older. It just, they weren't much take up because performance wasn't there. What's changed? Um, there's really a few things. So one of them is is just the, <clears throat> the constant drive of Moore's Law, right? So yeah. more yeah. compute for, for cheaper. Um, that's really enabled a lot of this to sort of blossom now, right? The compute power is there at a reasonable price and availability for a uh, wide variety of people. Um, the other thing is just the availability of data. You know, massive data being generated, like whether it's through IoT devices, um, images on the web, you know, the internet has certainly you know, spawned a lot of new data sources. Um, so having the data available, which you need a lot of it to train models and, and, and really base these algorithms on, having the compute, um, those are really the two you know, primary drivers for why some of these algorithms that were more or less just research topics are on the shelf are now being put into you know, much wider production. Um, and it's, it's a hot topic, you know, how much is actually in production, you'll get different debates about that, but certainly everybody wants to take a look at this, everybody says this is, this is likely going to be important to them, whether they've quite figured out how yet or not. So, yeah. All right, so we've got some prepared questions here. <laughs> okay. Um, boy. Okay, well, yeah, let's, let, let's just go to the general to specific here. Can, can you describe a couple of use cases where Intel tools were used to create uh, a machine learning code that's being used? Uh, out there in the world. 
Sure. So one of them uh, is a cloud service provider in China, mm -hmm. and one of the things that's important to them is detect like um, illegal content. So whether that's mm. um, you know, copyright <laughs> infringement or pornography or whatever they decide they're trying to they're trying to screen out of their their video. Um, and they used an Intel optimized version of the CAFE framework, an open source code out of, out of Berkeley. Um, and uh, they were able to, with the work we did versus their initial experiments, get about 30 times faster once they used our optimized frameworks with the libraries. Um, so that's an example of, you know, with, with the work we've done over the last year versus the standard off-the-shelf open source code, um, you know, we've been able to do some good optimization and deliver it. So now it's a production performance kind of platform for, for that company. So. Nice. Nice. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know if there's a good question or not, but... Um, so what are the key difficulties in getting machine learning code to scale? Okay, because this is HPC world, that's what we're about, right? Uh, getting it to run on big cloud data centers and sort of provide this to lots of people in a very quick fashion. Right? Okay, sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll divide it into two pieces. So first, yeah. there's just on a single node, right? Yeah. So, um, and this would be your, your sort of classic code modernization techniques, right? Where, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, we're beyond the point where you're just going to get processor frequency to deliver you more performance. So you've got to do something in code. So um, threading and vectorization are really the two big things that people people do. Mm -hmm. um, there are other techniques, of course, you know, core affinity and all these kind of things. but those are really your two major challenges on the single node, and it's equally true of machine learning codes as it is with other scientific codes and things we've seen, financial codes, all really need to these same techniques to be applied. Um, and then to be able to scale across a cluster, you know, multi-nodes, um, that has its own challenges in terms of, um, you know, distributing the compute load, recombining those, um, the individual um, uh, computations that are done on the nodes, and there's a variety of techniques for that. You know, in the HPC space, you, you've traditionally seen a lot of uh, uh, MPI, message passing interface. And then, uh, but there are others like like the uh, Spark framework is really popular for um, for machine learning, and they have their own distribution scheme. Yeah. Um, and of course, there's others, but those are just a couple of the common ones. And and you know, trying to you get the right algorithm for dispersing the compute yep. and efficiently combining that and dealing with the communication overhead between the nodes. Those are all things that, you know, if you want to really get optimal performance, you got to think about in terms of that scaling. Is this any harder than any other optimization problem that a HPC guy might come across, or is it just a different uh, genre or something? What, what I think it's think? more just a different genre. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's certainly unique expertise in the algorithms, mm -hmm. right? But I think a lot of it is shared um, that it won't be, there won't be a lot of surprises in how we're doing these optimizations to experienced HPC folks. Um, and, but, but you know, there is a, there is certainly a, uh, a particular expertise required in, in this area, particularly for someone who's writing a framework or optimizing a framework and really needs to understand the details of the algorithms to get that right. Someone who's just consuming and using the frameworks. Hopefully, if if we've done all our jobs right in the libraries and um, the framework authors, you know that that should be much easier for just the end user. But uh, but for those of us providing these tools and, and frameworks, you know that's the kind of thing we've got to focus on. Well, I just want to double click for a last question about MKDAO, for example. Right? Uh, is a lot of that optimization? Is that your job to make that so that the user isn't worried about it? That they plug in this library and they can get access to all that parallel hardware and everything to get performance on the back end without you know, worrying about it. Is that the idea? Yeah, that's a lot of it. <laughs> um, that's a lot of it. So, um, of course, you can't encapsulate everything in a library, yeah. but um, we do our best to do as many of these things as possible. So, as we learn more about, the, uh, you know, develop more expertise in machine learning, we've learned that oh gee, maybe this matrix multiply, we need to optimize different sizes, things like that. So we've done that in the library. Um, or we now have a, a new library we're breaking out for what we call for multi-node scaling to make it easy for the framework developers just make calls to this library and then it takes care of distributing the load across multiple nodes in a cluster. Mm -hmm. So that's another sort of piece we've been able to break off into a, a, a reusable library component. Uh, and then uh, another thing we do, and this is, this is more in the, the DAW library, the Data Analytics Acceleration Library you mentioned, 
is to really try to uh, make more efficient the, the reading of data simultaneous with the algorithmic processing of it. So for instance, here's an example where um, you have a bunch of data streaming in, too much to fit in memory at once. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to operate on it in chunks and move on to the next chunk of data as it streams in. Um, well, you don't really want that to be a total serial process. You don't want to wait for the next chunk and then start processing, and then wait and start processing. If you can simultaneously do processing and data ingestion, you can, in a, in a you know, streamed way, right, for, for this kind of data, uh, that can give you a lot, of, a lot of efficiencies as well. So those are some examples of things we've been able to encapsulate in libraries. Um, there's still plenty of work for developers <laughs> using the frameworks or for framework developers themselves to do outside of those libraries. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, our goal is definitely to encapsulate as much as possible so it's just available off the shelf and nobody has to do that work a, a second time, right, or a third time or a fourth time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's what I would be after for an article. That's a perfect conclusion. So, is there anything we're not tapping on that you think we need to talk about? Um, how so? much? How much do you think you should address, if anything, all of Parallel Studio? So, how they all work? The libraries work with the tuning components with VTune and maybe the compiler. Is there an aspect that we need to talk about, kind of? Yeah, I mean, you hit on a little bit. We talk about like threading and vectorization. Yeah, like, all of that is utilizing it. But I mean, you didn't specifically call out. And it's not yeah, a sales. It's that. not yeah. a sales a pitch, idea. but it's like yeah. adding the libraries to the the whole big picture of everything that you need to do to modernize your code. You have yeah. to recompile when you add your uh, library, right? So. And you probably want to go in and start doing performance tuning because you're going to find that you might have effed up here or there by adding that library. It's a technical term. Yeah, that's a good idea. So maybe we should talk about what are some other tools besides libraries. And yeah. that'd be a good lead in for you to talk more about productivity tools and things yeah, like we that. Yeah, so that way isn't everything yeah. working. This is yeah, great. Yeah. Okay. But I could hit a little bit the general software development tool angle and then, then turn yeah. it over to Bethany for some yeah. more things like that. So, Okay, so, so so for someone who's familiar with Intel development tools, how does this fit into the studio, right, as far as their process from beginning to end? Where, do, where does the MPL DAO and all that work together? Right, so, um, so libraries are something we've had for a long time in the, the Intel software development tool suite. And in particular, the math kernel library is, is very popular in, uh, in high performance compute. You know, virtually all the top 500 systems that use Intel processors, or for instance, are using MKL to do their matrix multiplies and things like that. So, um, and it turns out that those same base algorithms um, are, are equally applicable to machine learning. So, you know, matrix multiple, a lot of things come down really to matrix multiple. Mm -hmm. So those are things we can do, like I said, we can optimize in the libraries. But um, then there's just the, the general software development tool chain. So, um, you know, have, we provide the most efficient compiler for Intel architectures. Those are certainly applicable to, to machine learning codes. Um, we provide a range of performance analysis um, and a threading analysis tools, so tools like VTune that will help you figure out where's the hot spot in your code, some tight loop that you want to optimize. Um, these things all, these all general code optimization techniques certainly apply to machine learning. Uh, and uh, so, you know, people, if they're used to using these, these kind of tools in HPC or, or other development tasks, you know, they can, that same uh, training and, you know, can apply to the machine learning space as well. So. Um, so the libraries I mentioned are part of our, our parallel, tool, parallel Studio Tools suite. Um, you can buy a whole bundle of those, get the whole thing together. Or if you just want the libraries because you have other tools you prefer, that's great too. But, um, but all of our tool suite you know, would, uh, would apply to the machine learning space as well.